Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alejandra Mejia, and I'm an editorial associate at Duke University Press. Today, we are really lucky to be in conversation with the editors and three of the contributors of our newly published collection, We Are Not Dreamers, Undocumented Scholars Theorize Undocumented Life in the United States. And now I'll talk a little bit about the book, which we can also see the cover of the book in my background. So the contributors to We Are Not Dreamers, who are themselves currently or formerly undocumented, call for the elimination of the dreamer narrative showing how it establishes high expectations for who deserves citizenship and marginalizes large numbers of undocumented youth and other migrants. So the contributors of the collection work across a broad range of different disciplines. Um, so be before we get the conversation started, I'm just going to introduce everybody who's a part of the conversation. So we are very lucky to be joined by Lacey J. Abrego, um, Abrego, who is professor and chair of Chicano and Chicano Studies and Central American Studies at UCLA. We're also joined by Genevieve Negron Gonzalez, who is associate professor in leadership studies at the University of San Francisco. So these are the editors of the volume. And the contributors who are joining us today are Kathy Jocelyn Maldonado Dominguez who is a graduate of UCLA with a double major in Chicana Chicano Studies and Central American Studies and Geography. She is currently a doctoral student in the American Studies program at Yale University. We're also joined by Maria Liliana uh, Ramirez Liliana, who is a doctoral student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Irvine, where she also completed a Law, Society, and Culture emphasis. Prior to UC Irvine, Liliana completed her undergraduate degree in anthropology with a minor in Spanish language and literature at the University of California at Riverside. And then finally, we have Carolina Valdivia, who completed her PhD in education at Harvard University. She's currently a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow at UCLA. Carolina is also a recipient of the Ford Foundation Predoctoral Fellowship. And in fall 2021, she will join the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society at UC Irvine as an assistant professor. So like I said, we're very happy to be in conversation with everybody uh, around this incredibly timely and important book. So first of all, we're gonna start a conversation by talking to the editors and sort of getting a broad framing of the book. So Lacey and Genevieve, uh, would you just tell us about the book? Sure. Thank you so much, Alice. So uh, the book, uh, as you mentioned, is titled We Are Not Dreamers, uh, subtitle Undocumented Scholars Theorize Undocumented Life in the United States. Um, beautiful cover art by the, uh, by the um, artist Julio Salgado. And uh, the book is an edited collection. Uh, it has 10 chapters. Uh, three of the contributors are here today. Uh, it has 10 chapters which really focus on um, uh, empirical theoretical work by each, of the, by each of the scholars that are included in the book. The uh, intent behind the book, and I know we'll talk about this a bit, um, a bit later, was that we really wanted to be able to uh, showcase and engage with some of the really important empirical and theoretical contributions that undocumented and formerly recently undocumented scholars were making. So the 10 chapters are each solo authored um, and they cover uh, different aspects of undocumented life in the United States uh, in this time. And I'll read just a little bit from the introduction, uh, which talks about sort of the the um, the content of the chapters and the way that that uh, is presented in terms of the organization of the book. Uh, the first half of the book engages in the connection between identity, illegality, and resistance as a way to critically analyze how undocumented migrants have been made through the processes of undocumentation and illegality. The second half of the book centers quotidian life as a medium for the exploration of what an intersectional analysis of undocumented status looks like by grappling with the structures of relationships, family, and identity. These two halves then constitute a recasting of how we think about undocumented life in the United States. 
not simply as a collection of institutional interactions or a constellation of, of spheres of engagement, but rather as an examination of the ways undocumented actors move through the spaces of daily life and in doing so, remake those spaces in fundamental ways. So uh, we see the book making some really critical contributions and intervention uh, in the way that we think about undocumented life in the United States. Uh, and, um, and, and it grapples in a very direct way with the multiple spheres that that happens in and through. Great. Um, so again, so thank you so much. So again, for the editors and Genevieve, I think you touched a little bit on this in your response already um, to the first question. But the second question that we have is, what do you see as the main or primary contribution or intervention of the project? I think what's particularly exciting about this project, the thing that, that got us on this path is that we kept getting this sense from all of the research while we're also involved in accompaniment of the movement that we, in general, the literature treated undocumented young people as subjects and not as the scholars that we knew them to be because of our interactions with them in our classrooms and in our office spaces. And, and so this book um, really brings together the scholar and the, the scholars and their ideas, the things that we knew were going to shift the field. Yeah. And when we, when we talk about the book, we talk about it as, you know, uh, methodological and also analytical um, and political intervention in a lot of ways, right? It's a methodological intervention in the sense that um, of what of what Lacey just spoke about, right? That this is a very intentional effort to um, turn our attention to the really stellar work that undocumented and formerly undocumented scholars are doing. Uh, there's also analytical and 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 political uh, intervention in that one. We really believe that. Um, this work it has the potential to transform and shift and shape the field um, based on sort of the, the particular kinds of theoretical um, um, ideas that are being played with, the kind of empirical studies that are being, that are being uh, done that are focusing and prioritizing and examining dynamics of undocumented life that in many ways haven't been examined in, in, in previous scholarship. Um, there's also the political intervention and the title of the book comes from some of that political intervention as well, um, which is that the uh, focus on sort of um, a critical examination and a critique of the dreamer narrative is something that I think had been in the background um, for us all. But as we started to work with contributors and we started to talk with uh, the scholars themselves, as we started to see the chapters come in, uh, it was undeniable that this that this critique of the dreamer narrative was something that was not actually part of the background, but was something actually that came really clearly and very explicit, explicitly into the foreground. Um, and so we began to talk about that more explicitly. Um, and you know, this idea that um, that somehow educated young. Um, undocumented people are more worthy of citizenship than other members of their communities or their parents um, is something that uh, the scholars in this collection are really um, resolute in, uh, in, in speaking out against and in um, critiquing. And this is something that has happened on the ground in the movement for many years. Um, and so in many ways, this sort of scholarship speaks to that reality on the ground as well. Uh, but we felt like it was a, a particularly important political interjection uh, to be made in this moment, specifically as we are, again, sort of um, pushed into this conversation about who belongs and who doesn't belong, who is deserving of belonging, who is undeserving um, and we, one of, I think one of the things collectively that we're the most proud of in this collection is um, being able to collectively have put something out in the world that is a uh, rejection not only of that um, idea, but is, is a critique of even the foundation that that idea is, is, is sort of, you know, positioned upon. Um, that this is not even a conversation that we're willing to engage in because it is fundamentally flawed, fundamentally elitist. And, um, and in order to move forward with a real vision of justice, 
uh, we need to be able to call that out in really explicit ways. And I think that the collection as a whole and the individual chapters uh, do that really, really beautifully. Yeah, actually we didn't- Thank you so much. We didn't have this title. Uh, initially we had a kind of loose title that we were thinking through. And then after the first round of reading all of the chapters, it was just such a powerful narrative throughout all of them that it just made sense. They are not dreamers. Like this very powerful statement and the image that captures it now on the cover, I think speaks really beautifully to that. No, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and it's really great to hear about the intervention, both like academic intervention and sort of like political intervention that the book has. And I was able to work in the production of the book here at Soup Press. Um, yeah, and I just love, like Lacey was saying, the intentionality of like the title and then also the cover image, which is, uh, I think Julio Salgado is an undocu queer like artist and activist. So I think just the intentionality of the project uh, was something that like really spoke to me and something that I loved about just working on the production uh, of this title. Um, so kind of thinking about like the production of the book and all of it coming together. And I know that you sort of talked a little bit about this in the introduction of your book. Like what is the process of working with people who are undocumented or documented or like formerly undocumented and like the sort of like specific and, you know, things that are very like closely connected to people's like experiences and also like very sometimes like traumatic, you know, interactions that people have had with the legal immigration system here in the U.S. Um, so I was just curious, I was wondering if you could talk a, a little bit about how the book, how the book project came together logistically and what it was like to sort of like work with a cohort of, you know, junior scholars, also people who are, you know, themselves directly impacted people. Yeah, the whole process um, in a lot of ways felt really organic. I started teaching in 2010, and by that time I had published a few pieces about undocumented youth experiences and education in particular. And so students sought me out and I started working with people doing honors theses and different research projects on campus who were in the situation of being undocumented students who wanted the opportunity to take the research space to reflect on their experiences and challenges and resilience and all of that. And every time that I worked with students like that, I, I saw the brilliance, the, the incredible ideas that really were not matching up with what the literature was, was doing. And I kept thinking, you know, these voices need to be out there. And I was, you know, brand new assistant professor, but it was in the back of my mind that we needed to have some kind of volume to get this started. And in 2016, um, I was, Genevieve and I um, had met and, and were sharing about work and um, talking about the, from the perspective of the professors working with students, the kinds of support that we felt were most effective or meaningful in these cases and why it was so challenging. Writing is hard for everybody, right? We, we recognize that. Um, and writing was something that these students were doing really well in their classes and in lots of other spaces and activities. But when it came down to really having to sit and put down on paper, a lot of those things that they were as activists trying to avoid, ignore, um, really minimize to be able to feel empowered suddenly to have to face that on the page was, was overwhelming sometimes. And so we talked about that and I mentioned that I had this dream project in mind someday, you know, I would work on it. And it was funny, I, I very vividly recall this moment at a diner um, in Oakland. And I said that and I was just kind of, you know, thinking out loud. She's like, I'm in, let's do this, you know. And, and it's, so that, that was the first time it really became 
a thing, a real thing that we could work towards. And um, we then, you know, slowly started to figure out who could we include, who do we reach out to that already has some kind of either master's thesis or other work research that they've done. We reached out to colleagues um, around the country who work with undocumented students and and little by little, we, we got the 10 authors and it, it's been an incredible process to work with them, to see them um, slowly develop their, and everyone's at a different stage and had different you know, experiences with publishing and all of this, but to see them take ownership of their piece, to see them um, really celebrating each other once they had a chance to read each other's work or to, to hear about it, um, it's been so wonderful to see how uh, it's it's beginning to make sense in their minds. And maybe Liliana will share in, in her case, right? I just read part of her qualifying exams and she's already citing, you know, the chapters and, and that it's, it's just a, such a rewarding project to be a part of um, and to see this, this evolution. Yeah, and if, if I can just add, I think also, you know, the ethics of a project like this were really uh, in the foreground for us from the very beginning. And I think that um, it's just, it, it's worth mentioning because I think that there is a really important set of ethical questions, um, which also, of course, become political questions, right? Um, but around what does it mean to convene a collection of scholars like this? What does it mean to commit to them and say, you know, it may take us 20 revisions, but we're going to support you and get there. Um, in those 20 revisions, there's not going to be a point in there where we say, you know what, uh, maybe we should co-author this instead. No, we were committed from the very beginning to ensuring that these were solo authored pieces. We saw the promise in them from the very beginning, and we were committed to, to, to supporting these scholars um, in bringing that work to fruition. And the reason for that um, is because we really, I mean, the fact that Lily is, is citing these works is like, I mean, that's, that, that's because these are the works that should be cited. You know, these 10 chapters are the chapters that I'm looking to and towards in this moment to further my own thinking about how to make sense of the current uh, condition of this country and questions around citizenship and illegality. I'm learning from these from these chapters as well. These are the these are the the top of the list for what I want to assign to my students. Um, and so there is the there is the broader questions around you know sort of what what the what the contributions of the book are broadly, and then there's also sort of just the really exciting. Um, sort of reality that like these are 10 amazing chapters that are that have been put together through a labor of love and a lot of revisions um because writing is hard like Lacey said for everyone uh and the um the result is we really believe um you know really transformative uh scholarship uh that will really uh, assist us all in thinking in new and critical and and different ways about the current moment, about what possibilities and opportunities are for resistance. And uh, we really strongly believe that these are um, that these chapters and these scholars um, are contributing to the expansion and the development of of multiple fields. Uh, and that's just a really, really exciting. Uh, process to be a part of. So uh, I think Lacey and I both uh, really feel like it was, uh, we, are, we are the editors of the collection, um, but it was really just such an honor to be able to walk alongside these scholars um, as they really did the work to bring these pieces to, to fruition. And uh, I think the book is a really beautiful testament to that hard work. I'll just add that the day that I got the books, I took my time very carefully. I used citation software and I was one by one adding the information from each chapter because I know that I'm gonna be citing them and I'm really excited to. Thank you so much. I think it's definitely like super exciting for me to hear. And it's also very like felt, like it's very palpable in the introduction of the book, like how you frame the project and how you work. I mean, how you talk about working with these different scholars at like different stages of the process. Yeah, and just by like talking to you, I think the commitment to like ethical mentorship within, you know, academia and like critical ways of like centering, you know, conversations within like different fields um, and like specific scholars within different fields and just the critical 
like contributions that they're making and really like centering those voices. It's really, you know, inspiring to me. And I think it's, you know, a, a model that a lot of academics should adopt. Like it just seems like a very ethical, you know, politically just, yeah, just politically important model. Um, okay, and now we're really excited to talk to some of the contributors who are joining us today and hear a little bit about their own process and the work of, you know, working with the editors. And then Lacey and Genevieve, if you want to like jump in and add anything to any of the questions, please feel free to do that. So yeah, so just to hear from the, the side of the contributors, uh, why did you choose to be part of this project? I can go. It's really hard to to follow um, what you've just shared, Lacey and Genevieve. Um, I'm honestly really in awe at all the work that's um, led up to this project. And I was really excited as well when I received the copy in terms of why I chose to be part of this project. So two main reasons. Um, I've always appreciated and valued the work of Lacey and Genevieve. And so from the start, I knew that I really wanted to like I would love to work and learn from them. And I was also very excited about the project itself, because to me, it really centered questions that I was starting to think about in my own writing. And so at the time I was working on my dissertation and I was struggling with questions such as like how to discuss my own positionality in my writing, what role will it play on any given piece, like whether it's an article, a chapter, a book, a blog post, how can I use my writing as an opportunity for, or one of the other questions that I was thinking about is like, how can I use my writing um, as an opportunity to really sit down and reflect and try to grow and change from this? Um, when at times I knew that it was incredible, it was a source of um, a lot of pain because writing itself triggered many of the emotions that we've had to repress over the years just to try to get by on a daily basis. And so for me, I really appreciated the opportunity to be able to dig deeper into these types of questions, but also to have the support from Lacey, Genevieve, and fellow contributors to be able to work through these and not feel like I was doing this by myself or like the only one struggling through these. Um, I feel like what drove me was very similar to what has been said by Genevieve and Lacey. Like, going through undergrad and trying to do research and trying to identify my personal experiences with the research there was a struggle, mostly because um, there was this power dynamic of being a research subject and not really someone that has knowledge over these issues. So that was a big motivator for me because this project was an opportunity to shed some light on some issues that were important to me, like being undocumented and queer, which at the time that I was doing my undergrad and getting uh, motivated to do research it wasn't really there now it's growing but at the time it was really lacking um, so it was a great opportunity to be able to explore these issues um, with other people that were also exploring similar questions yeah very much like Lily and Caro I, I was excited I think just to be in conversation with a cohort of authors that understood and kind of shared the same experience but also at the same time I was just recently coming out of the undocumented student program at UCLA and I think that kind of gave me this sense that I could do research by myself and my research as an undocumented scholar actually had value and people would listen to it but also it showed me how important it is to have a community of undocumented scholars to talk to and have with yourself <laughs> with your journey but I think when Lacey first approached me with the project, it was a little unanticipated, mainly because my work doesn't, before the anthology, didn't quite focus explicitly on undocumented experiences. It's mainly about Central American students in higher ed. And like Otto and Lili are talking about the difficulty of writing about being undocumented. I think that's one of the main reasons I decided for a long time to not talk about undocumented scholarship or to not explicitly center that in my own work. But also I just had come out of that undocumented student program and I realized that maybe I should try to understand what that means. Like if anything for just for my own sake and to see what that means to me and what that scholarship can mean. And I think that this anthology kind of provided that opportunity for me to try and figure that out for myself. 
That's awesome. It makes me really happy to hear like how collaborative the cohort of contributors like became and how like, I don't know, transformative and like um, just like deeply personal, but also like a space to discuss all these like critical questions and think about what that means for like, your, your scholarship and like your research and your production of knowledge. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if everybody could sort of, if we could go around and talk to the different contributors about what your specific chapter is about. Um, and then also, you know, we know that you all are sort of coming from different disciplines, like education, anthropology, et cetera, um, both within like undergrad and then grad school. So, you know, coming from different disciplines, how does your disciplinary background inform the volume or inform the specific chapter contribution that you made? And how do you think, you know, your disciplinary background sort of relates to answering this question of theorizing a documented life in the U.S.? Okay, maybe we'll go in the same order. <laughs> um, the, so the chapter that I contributed to the collection is titled The Documented Young Adults Heightened Vulnerability in the Trump Area. And it focuses on the mental health consequences of living under the constant threat of deportation. And so one of the things that I really wanted to highlight with this book chapter is how undocumented community members with or without DACA are experiencing the current political moment in qualitatively different ways. Um, in the ways that it was manifesting itself, whether it was in terms of um, feeling increased feelings of anxiety, stress, and fear, but also in terms of like psychosomatic symptoms, which we often don't think about, like, um, for example, like headaches or unexplained stomach pains, um, eye twitches, you name it, like there was a, a broad range of those types of symptoms that were going um, often ignored or repressed and without medical, adequate medical treatment. Um, or whether that meant like access to counseling, therapy, support, things like that. Um, the main discipline that I'm drawing from is sociology. And so often how I think about what it means to be undocumented is always in relation with broader structural inequalities and how it affects how we come to understand the social world, others and ourselves. And so when thinking about the mental health consequences of being undocumented, for example, for me, I always think that it's important to also talk about um, the lack of access to health insurance and, and um, the lack of adequate access to medical care for the undocumented community, and as well, the long-term implications um, that this is having on one's physical and mental health. So the chapter that I contributed is titled Beyond Identity, coming at us undocumented queer. And the, so I wanted to explore what it meant to come out as both undocumented and queer, that formation of a double coming out, so to speak, and how undocumented and queer immigrants come out at different levels and multiple times and how it's so complicated. And mainly I wanted to highlight the ways in which undocumented queer people make sense of themselves without really exclusively relying to their undocumented status, which is a trend within some of the immigration literature out there. Um, and I wanted to highlight the importance of claiming agency and resistance through undocumented and, queers, <laughs> undocumented and queer immigrants' um, own understandings of being in the world. And I come from anthropology, but I feel like my background is also very interdisciplinary because I came into my discipline being influenced by um, queer migrations, which is not solely anthropology. It's very interdisciplinary from gender studies and feminist studies. Um, and I feel like that background brought in a lot of nuance in how to think about the law and identity and how people navigate certain social contexts. But also as Lacey mentioned, I have started to cite other people in this piece. And I feel like that is um, my biggest influence right now in theorizing undocumented life moving forward is that I think there's a lot of beauty in these chapters and thinking about how marginalized people create their own definitions of belonging and citizenship that are outside these um, nationalist constructions of citizenship that are tied to the law. Because when we focus on that, it just emphasizes limitations and constraints, but thinking about other ways that people are thinking as a belonging and citizenship just opens a lot of opportunities to center 
undocumented communities and actually shaping cultural citizenship that might be ignored if it's not thought outside of legal constraints. And my chapter focuses mainly on undocumented queer parenting and the ways that the strategies, but also the ways that's to combat xenophobia and homophobia. Sorry, that sounds jumbled. <laughs> but okay, so my main contribution to the chapter was focusing on documented queer parents because when I was writing the chapter or thinking about it, I kind of noticed that both migration studies and queer studies have try to bridge each other and talked about undocumented queer subjectivities, but oftentimes it's either about youth or about children and immigrant families. And I thought that undocumented queer parents also have something valuable to add to these conversations. And my main argument is that although we think that immigration policies and deportation may be the most disruptive intrusions into family life there's also other threats to family that need to be looked at which in this case was homophobia and the way that that created fissures within the family and of course this isn't to say that the impacts of xenophobia or homophobia are kind of scaled or ranked in any way I know Lily talks about how master statuses don't actually reveal as much as they actually hide so I think when we talk about undocumented queer subjectivities, we need to understand the undocumented and queer aspects of it simultaneously, like they does in her chapter. And I think mainly what I'm trying to get at <laughs> is that both of these experiences are not quite talked about, but parents are such crucial players or role, play such crucial roles in our lives that it seems kind of just natural to want to learn from them. And it seems like these two movements could learn from these experiences, if only these experiences were highlighted and actually voiced. And in terms of discipline, I come from a Chicano Chicano studies background, but initially I came to UCLA as an environmental science major and quickly noticed that that wasn't for me, that space wasn't quite catering to what I needed it to cater to. And it was in Chicano studies that I first heard a professor talk about undocumented communities. And that's the place where I first felt that I had something to talk about, that I felt I was centered. And then I think that kind of shapes the way that I theorize about undocumented, I guess, realities and that it's a little more generous in the ways that it allows you to think about your reality. So it's, it, it allowed me to be creative in ways that I feel maybe wouldn't be the case in more traditional disciplines that have rigid methods and rigid frameworks to follow. And Chicano studies kind of just allowed me that fluidity. Thank you so much, um, everyone. I can already see that these are really important and obviously understudied contributions. And I also love like Kathy citing Liliana, uh, Liliana and sort of seeing how that like you know, how the different pieces like speak to each other, um, how the conversation just like builds throughout the volume. And it's like, you know, you're informing like each other's scholarship as this like cohort of contributors. So I definitely think that's super powerful. Um, so the next question is, how do you hope that the book will be received within both academic and social justice spaces, particularly? I would say that I'm really excited for community members in both of these spaces who themselves identify as currently or formerly undocumented to be able to read the work of people who share that same experience of growing up undocumented um, and also to see their experiences reflected through this unique lens. I think that that definitely speaks volumes in and of itself. Um, and honestly, personally, like this is definitely the type of book that I wish I had while growing up, and especially while I was navigating graduate school. And so I'm just really excited and I can't stop sharing it with other people because this is exactly the type of book that um, I think at a personal level, like it just, it speaks volumes. Yeah, similarly, I feel like, I hope it allows like younger generations to be able to connect especially with research because as I mentioned there was always that disconnection so I hope it generates more of that engagement with this scholarship beyond just you know academics um, but I'm also very curious to see how it 
it is actually received on both parts. Because, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, to echo everyone, I mean, I hope it's received well. <laughs> that would be everyone's a dream come true. But um, I think that in academic spaces, it, if it's not, like, regardless of how it's received, it's creating a space for undocumented students to see themselves in part or in whole and to know that they have a space and they have the ability or rather the freedom to explore their research and the way that they're theorizing about things in the ways that they want to, like on their own terms and not rather what previous literature has told them to do. And within social justice realms, I think, I mean, I, I'm not too sure I would hope so. And like, like I mentioned, I feel like these movements have a lot to gain from listening to these experiences. So I think it'd be a fruitful experience for both fields or realms. Thank you. Lacey and Genevieve, do you want to add any thoughts to this question specifically? Genevieve and I have been exchanging texts quite often and, you know, screenshots of things. There seems to be a lot of excitement about the book. We were getting uh, requests and questions about it before it even came out. People who were already assigning it were adding it to their syllabi and then, you know, nervously asking, when is it coming? The semester starting. Um, so we know people are aware that it's out there and we're just super thrilled. We keep telling people, let us know what you think, you know, because we're sure that these chapters are going to open their eyes to a lot of things that people haven't been considering. It's really exciting for us. Yeah, colleagues have been asking, you know, what chapter should I sign? I'm like, all of them. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think I think to to just draw out a couple of other particular points. Um, one is that um, just to say really explicitly, in case we haven't already, I think you know the. Um, the academy and the community are often talked about as these sort of two separate spheres. And one of the things that I think has always made me be really proud of this collection and the way that it came about and the and the and the contributions. Um, and I think this is really evident in the writing as well, is that um, that division between sort of the community and the academy is something that I think all of us, everybody who has their hands in this book. Um, have struggled with uh, over, you know, many years. Uh, and we've all in different ways engaged in um, community work, you know, um, and, you know, in different aspects and different grassroots movements. And, and in a lot of ways, the, the research and the theorization that's coming out of this, I mean, we've talked about sort of our, you know, our academic credentials, but I, I know for me personally, much of my political development came out of engagement in grassroots movement work. Um, and I think that that's true for many of the other contributors as well, is that so that it's not that like we learned this stuff in graduate school um, or in our sort of academic worlds. And now we want, we're, we're hoping that it'll be applied in, in sort of in, you know, in community work, but rather there's a much more integrative process. We, in many in many ways are the products of grassroots community efforts, um, our thinking, our development politically and otherwise has come in and through that process. Um, and um, and so to me, sort of the, the question of like, you know, sort of reception is also a complicated one because it's like, you know, I'm hoping, my, my main hope is that there is um, of course, positive reception, because I think that the chapters are really beautiful and really powerful, but also I hope that there is continued conversation and dialogue and that we are able to sort of continue to, um, you know, break down that barrier between the community and the academy. And I think contributions like this by scholars like these really help in that in that aim and that effort. Um, the other thing that I'll just add is that uh, citations are, are political, that there is a politics of citation in academia. And um, there are certain uh, groups of people who get uh, cited more. And I think all of us need to be doing better on that. And so I also hope that this is a call to our colleagues um, to uh, not only not only you know sort of our our peers but also our seniors um, and also our students coming up. Um, I think these are the these are the kinds of empirical work that that we need to um, um, ensure that we're citing that we are uh, directing our attention to 
uh, and uh, these scholars, uh, some of them are in academia, some of them are starting faculty positions, some of them are still doing graduate work. Some of them, we have work in the book that is from students uh, undergraduate uh, theses. Um, we have people who are working not in, 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 um, in academia or in the university, but are doing uh, work on the ground um, or in industry even. And, uh, you know, my hope is that we can see all of these contributions and that our fields can see all of these contributions for the, the power that they hold um, and that we take seriously our responsibility to um, to uphold uh, the work of these of these really incredible up and coming scholars. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is, like I said, by citing, by assigning um, and by and by uh, encouraging others to read the work of these scholars as well. Thank you so much. Um, and then we have just one final question, which is how do you see the book speaking to the present moment, particularly regarding COVID-19 and the ever-changing and sort of ever-threatened status of DACA? And also I would add other types of immigration or like legal protection. I feel like, so like undoubtedly the current pandemic, the ongoing uncertainty regarding DACA, as you mentioned, as well as the upcoming 2020 presidential elections, I feel like they're definitely great sources of anxiety, stress, and fear for many undocumented and mixed status families. And so I feel like the book is definitely uniquely positioned to not only understand these lived experiences from the lens of formerly and currently undocumented scholars, but also to think more critically and creatively about the type of resources that are so desperately needed um, to better support families through these challenging times, um, but also the type of change that communities need beyond previous narratives, such as the dreamer narrative, um, which has excluded so many within the community. So um, I'm hoping that it will make those critical interventions when we're thinking about resources, what type of policies we need at the local, state and federal level. Building on what Carolina said, um, I agree on all of that. I think this book speaks to the importance of being in conversation again with undocumented immigrants, especially in regards to the needs of undocumented people in times of precarity. I think often it's in these times of crisis, it's very easy to talk over people and sort of guess what they need. Um, but I think it's the opposite. It's really important to be in conversation with people that are directly impacted to know exactly what are the needs to be able to give those resources to the community. Yeah, to echo everyone, I think, I, I think what I keep thinking about the most right now is just the way that undocumented communities during COVID were often called essential workers and then what does it mean to be an essential worker and have your life constantly under threat and constantly in the front lines of either a pandemic or racial capitalism or all the other systems of repression and I think people have said or have reflected on the pandemic and seen how COVID has exacerbated or, or rather kind of highlighted the inequalities that have existed so I think it's a moment for us to try and be generous with ourselves but also to try and actually uh, tackle these inequalities keeping in mind that there are various communities out there that are being affected in very different ways so like Lili said to listen to these communities and be in conversation with them I think is one of the ways that this book is pushing us to try and tackle issues during these uncertain times. Lacey and Genevieve, do you want to add anything? Oh, uh, I, you know, I was just going to say that there's so much on the line in this current moment. Um, I think that we are all feeling it so palpably. Uh, it is a really critical, um, it's a critical moment in time that, of course, has its roots in all of, you know, sort of the, all of the other moments that sort of laid the groundwork for this. Um, but I, I'm just... I, I hold on to this image. Uh, I hold on to um, these contributions and I hold on to the promise that these scholars represent as just a reminder to all of us that we need to be doing whatever it is that we can to usher in a new, a new moment of immigration reform, uh, of comprehensive immigration reform, that we need to be doing all that we can to be ensuring that the politics around 
um, not only migration, you know, but policing environment, um, the economy, everything that we um, need to be doing all we can to um, usher in a different politic, a different moment um, that allows us to think in an expansive and new ways around sort of the dignity of all people. Uh, so, you know, this, that's not about the book in specific, but to me, it represents sort of the, the forward motion, uh, that we need to, to be, to be in and that we need to be cultivating, uh, and it's a responsibility on all of us. So for me, in a lot of ways, the way that the book speaks to the current moment is as a reminder of what's at stake, um, a reminder that all of us have a place in that fight and, um, a, a, a sense of responsibility about what we do with that, um, moving forward in the coming uh, weeks and months and, and years. I will add that having worked on this project, one of the things that has become crystal clear for me is how powerful collective work is and that that's what we need right now. Um, you know, Genevieve talked about the, the ethics behind all of it. We've all been working really hard to make sure that this project means something for the authors, for the communities. All of the royalties are also going to this incredible organization that works with the most unprotected people, um, people seeking asylum who have been unable because of the fast-paced and very unlawful changes in asylum policies have been unable to even enter the U.S. So the, the kind of lack of protection that they're in, this organization Al Otro Lado is doing that work to, to help asylum seekers and, and all the proceeds from the project, the, the royalties are going to go to that. And that was a conversation that we had as a group and it was a decision that we made together. And it's another way that, that again, became clear how much more power there is in, in this kind of collective action. And that, to me, that's what the, the book represents. Thank you so much. I definitely feel so grateful to have been in conversation with you and to have worked on this book's production. Um, because just like, you know, working from the production end of the book, like I was able to sort of like see firsthand how so many of the choices like you were talking about were really intentional choices like from the level of like design, you know, from your part, like from the level of design to thinking about like, you know, where do we want to donate like the honorarium for this book to, um, yeah, and definitely just like the contributions and the different voices that are being centered. And, you know, um, it's just, I think for me, it's just a very intentional, like very political project and one that is so, like grounded in its political contribution and like just intentional in so many different ways. So I definitely feel super grateful to have been the editorial associate for this book. And thank you, Ale, to you and Hisela for uh, your incredible uh, leadership and mentorship of us in the process as well. I think it was meant for the two of you to be the editors and assistant that we got to work with on this project because you saw it and you you recognized its value from the beginning. And I think that that shows in the final product. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.